everyone. My name's Christy. Welcome to my corner. Thank you for joining me today for a flip through of this Corticelli Home Needlework Journal from January of 1899. This was a gift from a stitchy friend of mine who found it in a box of crafts, uh, other craft supplies, and she thought that I would like it and she was right. It's almost like you all know me. I'm so excited. I was so excited to receive this. It's an amazing journal and I really can't wait to go through it with you. And of course, you can't send a historian a 120 year old journal <laughs> and not have me do some historical research on it. So we're gonna talk about not just doing like a flip through of the pretty pictures and the cool tips and tricks that it has, but we're also gonna talk about a history of the company that produced the journal and that published the journal the women who made the journal, and also a very brief history of the silk thread industry that was apparently thriving in New England, in particular Florence, Massachusetts, in the late 19th, early 20th century. But before we get to all of that, I want to welcome my new subscribers. Thank you so much for joining me on my artistic and crafty adventures. And welcome to everyone else who's been with me for however long you've been with me. Um, it's been great to get to know you in the comments here on YouTube and also on Instagram. And if you are not following me on Instagram, you can find me at Dr. Underscore Christy. I'll put that right here. And that's where I post pictures of kind of my daily stitching, of baking, of walks with my dog, of my dog who is like the cutest pups ever. And basically just everyday stuff. So if you want to see what I'm doing during the week, that's where you can find me at Dr. Underscore Christy. This is a channel about embroidery and cross stitch other textile crafts and baking although not at the moment <laughs> for reasons I'll explain and history and the history of all of those things. So if any of that is interesting to you and you're not subscribed, I'd love to have you subscribe and stick around. So this video is different than most of my videos because it's, it's all hands all the time because we have not, uh, it's August, it's mid August in Mississippi and we haven't had air conditioning in our house in three weeks. So essentially I'm melting. <laughs> And nobody wants to see that. So I decided to do an all hands, all the time video. I hope that you're okay with that. I will try to be as expressive with my hands as I possibly can, which should work out since I am an Italian American and we tend to talk with our hands anyway. So it, it just be a little bit more expressive. But you are here to talk about this needle workbook. And when I saw this, I was super excited and I decided to do a little bit of research, like I said, and I came up with such amazingly interesting facts about this text. I think what we're going to do is we're going to do a little history, do a little pretty pictures, history, pretty pictures, right? I think that's how we're going to work this project. So let's start with the cover. I love this illustration. This is sort of a quintessential white American Victorian woman who is sitting at home with her kind of palms behind her uh, embroidering on her frame. Um, it's sort of a little rose. And, um, you know, she has her puff sleeves, which anyone, I don't know, who, <laughs> whenever I think about puff sleeves, I always think about Anne of Green Gables. Anyway, she has her puff sleeves like Anne of Green Gables would have loved. Um, and I, and I uh, appreciate that very much. So there is no notation of who designed and drew this cover, but I believe that the person who did this was named Alice Cordelia Morse. And the reason why I think that is because in 1898, Corticelli put out a home needlework book and this cover I know was done by Alice Cordelia Morse. And so I'm going to move this over and put a picture of the other cover of that book right here. And I think the styles are similar enough that you can make an argument for them being done by the same person. Another key fact about Alice Cordelia Morse is that she was, she worked closely with Mrs. Candace Wheeler, who is the main author of this text. Candace Wheeler was a really interesting figure who was a textile designer. And she was basically one of the premier textile designers of the late 19th century. And she founded multiple organizations to help 
women use textiles to support themselves. So she organized the Associated Artists. She founded the New York Society of Decorative Art in 1877. She was instrumental to the World's Columbian Exposition in 1883, I think it was, which had a women's building which showcased women's art. And these organizations helped women not just learn how to do art, including needlework, but also how to sell that art and make a living off of their artwork. So Candace Wheeler is kind of a big deal. And I'll put a link down below to some of her textile designs um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art because they're really quite beautiful. And when you look at them, you'll see that there are quite a few um, applique. I don't think I can put them in this video because of copyright. They can't be reproduced. But I'll link to the Metropolitan Museum of Art page down below so you can check it out. So Candace Wheeler, who organized this text, right? She was kind of a big deal in this text. She worked closely with Alice Cordelia Morse, both during Alice's education and also at that World's Columbian Exposition. So there's a connection between Alice Cordelia Morse and Candace Wheeler. Also, Alice Cordelia Morse was really well known for her book covers. And in her heyday, um, she did dozens and dozens of book covers. She worked for Lewis Comfort Tiffany, who does the glass work. Um, she also, after retiring from doing book covers, uh, so essentially in the early 20th century, publishers realized that printing paper book jackets was cheaper than paying someone to illustrate on fabric book covers, which was what Alice Cordelia Morse did. Um, so she quit that job to... Uh, work in, in schools and become an educator in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And she became the supervisor of the public, the public school system, as well as a supervisor of the art and drawing programs for elementary schools. So she became a pretty well-known educator in the area. And after retiring, moved to New York City, where she died in 1961 at the age of 98. And before she died, she donated uh, a bunch of her book covers to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So if I can find her other book covers, I'll put them down below as well. So I'm pretty sure that Alice Cordelia Morse designed this cover. So that's where I kind of want to start. So let's look at some, let's look at some pretty pictures or a pretty picture. And we've already seen this one. This is Pansies and this is an embroidery piece. There are quite a few different colored plates in this book, which are really lovely. So we have the pansies, we have several roses. So here we have some um, red rose, the American Beauty Rose, and we have the Catherine Mermit Rose. So we have these beautiful plates. Now most of the plates are floral as are most of the designs in this, in this book, in this journal. Um, another rose design, the Marichal Neil Rose, the La France Rose, and then we have a tulip design. What is this? Ooh, thistle, that's beautiful. And I think that all of these, uh, and irises, I think all of these are in, oops, I'll move it up, sorry. I think all these are in the text as well. So we'll take a look at that in a bit too. So there are some of the plates that, um, you can, that can be found within this text, but I wanted to open it up and um, talk about the contents because this isn't really just pretty pictures. It also teaches you a lot about embroidery. It was made, uh, it seems to have been made for um, not just advanced artists, but also beginners. And so, you know, how you select the, the, the right material, how do you launder embroidered linens, the proper needles for embroidery, the how much silk you need for a piece, information for beginners needleworks. But then they have an interesting section called the theory and method of embroidery. And it essentially tells you how to begin an embroidery piece. You have the different designs after that kind of essay, you have lots of different designs. And she talks, and they talk about ecclesiastical embroidery, 
centerpieces and doilies, um, Corticelli decor crochet designs because the silk company had crochet silk and knitting silk as well as embroidering silk, embroidered pin cushions, suggestions for monograms, cross stitch sofa pillows. There is a color plate for that that I'll show you at the end and then um, other important information. So then of course we have our advertisements and I love old advertisements. I don't know about you, but I love old advertisements. And so we have the Florence Knitting and Crochet Silk. Um, and this is from Florence, Massachusetts and Florence Publishing Company. So Florence was a center of silk production in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. And you can also see that there are other journals that came out before this one did so you and you know you can order them if you want them but i love that it talks about what's in there right so this is about knitting this one 88 is out of print so you can't get it uh, tatting knitting and embroidery crocheting embroidery darning mosaic embroidery etc etc so i think that these cover a wide array of different textile processes that you can use for the florence silk right I want to talk about this picture. This picture is of the Nonatuck Silk Mills, which were located throughout Massachusetts and Connecticut. This is the company that publishes this journal and that published the Corticelli Home Needlework book from 1898, the Nonatuck Silk Company. This company has a really interesting history. It was sort of originally founded in the early 1800s and called the Northampton Silk Company, which was founded by a man named Samuel Whitmarsh in 1837. And Whitmarsh bought mulberry trees and promoted this sort of silkworm cottage industry on and around his property. And he took that silk and he um, made thread out of it in different factories but it became like like a mulberry tree bubble like the housing bubble that happened and he ended up uh, well the bubble burst and uh, the company went out of business however the mills were purchased by the Northampton Association of Education and Industry which was an abolitionist utopian organization that wanted to maintain the factories to provide good living wages for people in their kind of utopian society that they were trying to build but for various reasons that didn't work and it dissolved um, not too long afterwards <laughs> like several years it, it only took a couple years but one of the co-founders of this group of the Northampton Association bought the silk mills and imported silk from outside of the United States. So instead of trying to create like this cottage industry in the United States where people weren't really all that good at raising these silkworms, he decided, um, his name was Samuel Lapham Hill, decided to import these cocoons from Japan in particular. And this worked out really great. But the thing that made him successful was that he met Isaac Singer of the Singer sewing machine. And Singer was looking for a thread, a silk thread that was strong enough to go through his new home sewing machines because hand sewing put less tension onto thread than machine sewing. And hand sewing, the thread can have, it doesn't have to be perfect, right? It can have issues with the thread and it'll still work pretty well. With, with machine sewing, however, the thread has to be strong and even and without any kind of um, slugs in it, without any kind of knots in it. And again, it has to go, it has to be strong enough to go through the sewing machine. Hill decided to invent essentially a machine that would spin the silk threads into a three ply that was strong and smooth and even. And he showed it to Singer and Singer like basically said, give me all your silk, right? I will give you all this money. I will buy all of it. Whatever you can make, I will buy. And um, you know, we'll, we'll produce it. So the Nonatuck Silk Mills 
And Northampton, Massachusetts in particular, which they changed the name of the Silk District to Florence in honor of the, uh, you know, Florence, Italy, which was the main silk producing city in Italy, became the largest, this company became the largest silk thread company in the world, in Massachusetts, which I did not know. So that's why this is very interesting to me, because these are the factories that were creating the silk um, that, you know, built this journal. And in order to play off a little bit more off of the the Italian, the so-called Italian connection, they named some of their threads Corticelli, and they named other threads Bartolini. These two became essentially the most popular threads of the Nonatuck line. And eventually in the early 20th century, the Nonatuck company, uh, Silk Company, changed its name to Corticelli. So Corticelli Home Needlework is essentially named after, at this point, it's named after the thread, a particular kind of thread. So that's kind of the history of the silk production in Massachusetts in the late 19th, early 20th century. The company um, kind of lost a lot of their business with the advent of imitation silk, so things like rayon, which was much cheaper. And eventually, after the Depression, um, the company did end up going out of business. So that's where we end up with the Nonatuck Silk Company and the Corticelli name. So the first thing I want to talk about, um, and I mentioned that it has lots of neat uh, tips, right, for for starting an embroidery. It has some beautiful images. But what I find very interesting is this theory uh, and method of embroidery by L. Barton Wilson. I couldn't find anything about L. Barton Wilson except that she was the author of this um, in this journal. But the great thing about this is not only you get to see like pictures of how this is working. So you get to see pictures of women embroidering, which is the kind of daily activity that is often erased. So that's one of the things I love about this. But it gives you diagrams of what to do. So what this section is about is preparing your embroidery for a frame. And this is stitched on a frame, as you can see here. Um, it talks about how you stitch uh, essentially two-handed. And it looks like she is, so she does it opposite than what I would do because I would, if I were stitching it as a right-handed person, I stitch up with the right hand and down with the left hand and it looks like she's opposite. And I know some of you um, do stitch this way as well. Here we see hoops and it looks like it's a wrapped hoop. And it also looks like it is a uh, it is not a hoop like we have with the screw on it. It looks like it's just two wrapped hoops that hold it together. You can see her forcing the hoop down to make it drum tight, which is what we all want, I think, in embroidery. But they also have embroidery stands, which I love, right? She's using like a vice stand. Um, you know, I, I don't have one, but I know many people do, and I kind of really want one. Um, and here again, we have stitching in the hoop. So this little essay is really exciting for me as a historian of, of women, even though I'm a medieval historian, having access to images of women doing everyday work is just kind of amazing. So that is an amazing thing about this journal. And I think other women's journals, right? Women's journals show the lives of normal women. And these are middle-class women uh, which is not surprising because Candace Wheeler, who is the main author of this, was a middle class woman and she was very proud of her middle class heritage. She was very proud that she was able to make a living from doing embroidery and from teaching other women how to do embroidery. And she was a feminist, um, but she wasn't a radical feminist, but she really felt that she had the duty and the opportunity to help women who are younger and less fortunate than her learn the skills of embroidery and other artistic crafts and make a living from those artistic crafts. So this woman um, is, is a normal middle-class woman. And I think that's really, really cool. 
Then we have fun embroidery stitches, all different embroidery stitches. And these are stitches that we still use today, the long and short stitch. We have a simple couching stitch. We have a satin stitch, right? These are all kind of common stitches, but then we have things like what is this? The frill basket stitch. That's kind of interesting. Brick couching. This is very similar to the, this is called a diaper couching stitch, which is kind of like a, what's it called? A lattice stitch, right? Where you have the cross, like you have the, the perpendicular um, and then the little tacking down stitches. The Kensington outline stitch, which is a stem stitch essentially, right? We have a back stitch, a split stitch. The split this split stitch is interesting because this is actually a back split stitch as opposed to a regular split stitch, because a regular split stitch comes up from the bottom th through the last stitch, and this one goes down through the stitch. So that's interesting. Anyway, there are lots of different stitches, some that we recognize, a honeycomb stitch, some that we don't. Here's a blanket stitch. Um, and that's, um, that's really fun. A buttonhole stitch. Yeah, these are, these are really great. So here are, there are a bunch of embroidery stitches. Um, this will be very useful, I think, for next year when I do my temperature pattern, which will be um, a different stitch every day. So it'll be the, 300, the 365 stitch project. Uh, and this will be helpful for that, I think, right? And then we talk about she, this, it kind of talks about how you can use these stitches. So you have things like centerpieces and doilies, and these are things that would go on a table. And they're mostly uh, floral, right? And so here's the La France rose design. So you would put this design in this piece here. It tells you how, what kind of silk you need, how many skeins you need. Uh, it tells you, it looks like the colors, right? It has kind of all the details that you need, which is really exciting. An iris design, and I showed you that iris before, so here's the iris design. And tool up here it is, the iris. And then we have floral terms, it looks like, which is kind of fun. So when they're describing what goes where, they have a glossary of floral terms. And then ecclesiastical embroidery. And I find this very interesting because the church is a place that has significant amount of embroidery. If you follow the Royal School of Needlework on Instagram or um, YouTube, a lot of the commissioned work they do is for the church. So this is a pomegranate design that uh, is pretty common in um, church. Uh, pomegranate is kind of like the, the life, it, it represents life a lot of times. And so having it in here is not uncommon. So here is like a colored plate that is this design essentially. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that means um, Jesus Christus, right? Jesus Christ, I would imagine anyway. Here we have um, floriated cross, which is beautiful. And you can tell this page had a bit of a printing issue. It's a little bit blurry. Um, I don't know if you can tell that it's blurry in the camera, but I can definitely tell. It looks it looks almost like those old 3D, uh, like, you need it, like you need 3D glasses, those old school 3D glasses um, on this. So here we have another design, the ordination stole, um, which does not go with this poppy design. Another stole. Here we have morning glory, carnations, and we are now in. Ooh, so we're in more centerpieces and doilies. So the poppies, the car, the morning glories, carnations, fuchsia, right? And it looks like someone at some point traced these designs in pencil, um, and you can see on the back. I don't know if you can see that it's kind of embossed. So uh, I might go through and erase these pencil marks at some point, but fern. So it gives you kind of lots of different options for uh, florals in particular. Holly, which is very pretty. And this would be like a holly wreath um, for, for Christmas. 
And here we have non-flowers. We have birds, we have swallows and butterflies. And that makes me very happy. And you can see here, you would kind of organize them in a um, in the circle for the centerpiece. Strawberries, which I showed on my floss tube last week, which would have strawberries and strawberry blossoms. And I love this because the strawberries are very realistic, right? You have flowers and partially ripened and fully ripened strawberries all together. And I think that would be a beautiful little, little design. Cherries, which again has more pencil that I want to get rid of. Honeysuckle, I love me some honeysuckles. Orchid. So here we have um, different kinds of designs, right, that aren't necessarily floral, which are very pretty. And, uh, oh, and it's a crochet as well. Here we have initials and monograms. And we have counting. So here is the uh, cross stitch sofa pillow design. And then here is the other cross stitch sofa pillow design. And I, I love those. So here's what they will look like. This one here is this design. And this design here is this. And I mean, that looks like Ada to me. That's very interesting. So let's see what it says. Rope silk, tricot cloth, and Riva cloth. So this is Riva cloth here. It looks like Ada, but again, this is very, um, this is very blurry again. So this is printed very awkwardly again. So that's, I mean, that's the interesting things that you have in here. Here's some pin cushions, right? Uh, those are very, those are very uh, lacy, <laughs> lacy pin cushions, whatever, to each his own. But again, one of the fun things about this kind of book is that you have these great ads. So here you have an embroidery hoop uh, that has this like metal thing here that allows it to, you know, stretch like a modern hoop ish, ish, like a modern hoop. You can buy embroidery frames from the company. You can buy needles from the company as well. And then you see the Florence embroidery hoop holder that was advertised or was shown in the article at the beginning and then different kinds of machine silk, um, machine twist silk. You also have um, wool knitting and crocheting yarn here. And then at the end you have the important information. And what I wanted to talk about here is that um, you could purchase stamped fabric from Corticelli uh, or from the Florence Publishing Company. But we learn that Mrs. Candace Wheeler's article on the art of embroidery was, was received too late for publication in this number. It will be printed in the next issue. I wish that I had that because I would, I think that that article would be fascinating. And I would love to know like what she says about this. So I'm going to try and hunt this down. If I can't find a digital, if I can't find a print copy, I'll, I'll try to find a digital copy and see if I can, because I would love to have that article. And then of course you can subscribe, right? You just send 15 cents, I think it is, and um, subscribe to the journal. And then at the very end on the back page, you have an, an ad for um, patterns for knitting um, using this silk. So essentially this journal was like the purpose of this journal was to get people to learn how to do needlework or knitting, depending on kind of which um, volume and number you are in, in order to sell the thread, which was produced in Florence, Massachusetts. So it's all kind of, it's sort of like in the 1980s when you had cartoons that the sole purpose of the cartoon was to sell toys to children, right? Things like He-Man and that kind of stuff. Um, this is very similar. The purpose of this needlework journal was to get women to buy the silk threads and the cotton threads to do the work. So 
I think I'm going to end it there. I hope this was interesting to you. It was really fun for me to do the research, find out more about this topic, more about the women who are involved in this journal, more about the textile industry in New England in the late 18th, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And I hope that you enjoyed it as well. I obviously didn't cover everything. I didn't want this to be too long, but I hope that it was interesting to you. So I'm going to keep an eye out for more of these because I really love these. If you have a line on any, or if you happen to pick up any at um, different sales or whatever, please let me know. I will buy them off you or pay shipping. You can find me at Dr. Arnscore Christie, like I said, and also uh, my email address is down below. I think I'm going to end it there. I'm losing my voice. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank you for joining me on this adventure and giving me the chance to talk about this history of this um, really interesting journal. I will see you next Friday for my fortnightly floss tube. And with all that being said, please take good care of yourselves and have a good one. Bye. Mm -hmm.